Mr. Mark. Willie, how are you today, my friend? Happy BS Friday Live to you, Dave. Yeah, where are you at these days? You look like you might be back at uh, your homestead. We got a little studio time, and uh, it's uh, it's nice to have my voice back. So uh, cheers to that, Dave. Yeah, cheers to you as well. Hey, today we got an awesome conversation for you. We got two guests. One's been on the show before, and then we have a newbie, Mark. We got a rookie. We got a rookie coming on the show. No, oh, but no stranger to shows. But no stranger to shows. How about no, that? Definitely no stranger to the show. So, all right. With that said, uh, everyone, we're going to talk about BS Friday today. We're going to be live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter. And if you're not following and subscribe to any of those, especially the YouTube channel, you're wrong. We are growing and we are growing fast and we're having a lot of fun doing it. And I want to thank everybody out there that has been following along with us the entire time. Amen to that. This is number 158. Yeah, for a lot of people who don't know, uh, last Friday was our three-year anniversary. Three years we've done this show, and for three years, uh, we have never missed a Friday. Think about that. Three years straight, uh, we have always been on this show live. So that's awesome. All right, Mark. So Mark and Mark, we're going to have a lot of Marks. I may have to name you. Uh, you, you might have to go by Bare Naked today. Well, uh, then cover your eyes, folks. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Perfect. So why don't we hop into it today? So we have two guests coming on. We're going to bring in ladies first. Cheryl Lewis. Hey, Cheryl Lewis. They're from Thank Cheryl you, Lewis. Good to see you. You too. Surprise, you surprise. It's always fun. <laughs> Well, we're going to let you tell everybody a little bit about who you are in just one second, but we can't leave our other guests sitting in the wings. Let's bring in Mark LaLiberté. Hey, Mark, what's happening, buddy? Hey, guys. Nice to join you from uh, Reno, Nevada today. It's beautiful, sunny, snow's melting. Sierra Nevadas are losing their snow cap pack, and it's, yeah. uh, it's all good. Yeah. Well, wow. Something tells me there's no snow where Cheryl is. I'm not in Florida, Mark. I'm in Connecticut. Oh, so, it's cold in Connecticut, right? What's there really cold. It's cold. Yeah. Yeah. I miss Florida. Yeah. yeah, me too. Me too. Well, listen, we're going to have a fun show today. We're going to be talking about building science. We're going to be talking about the trades. We're going to be talking about the workforce. How do we educate the workforce? How do we solve some of the biggest problems that maybe even the biggest builders out there have? That's all today. But first, Cheryl. You are the super connector of our industry. You are the person that brings all of the influencers and product people together in the world of building materials and putting on shows and putting on stages and inviting uh, inviting myself last year. Well, I guess it was this year, really, right? To the International Builders Show uh, and to be on stage. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do, but you only have a minute to do it now. Okay, we got a long have to stuff. talk fast. <laughs> Go for it. Or yours. So for years, I thought that people should be able to play with building materials and fire hoses and tear things apart and put them back together. So I decided to go to IBS, to the International Builder Show, and ask them if we couldn't do that on the stage so that we could teach builders how to build better. And it's because of all of you that I've learned so much throughout the years. And I just continue to do that wherever I'm needed and connecting dots for you know influencers and how to build better homes. I'm going to be in D.C. with you, I think, Mark. Uh, for the HUD event. Uh, I'm going to be in Connecticut, hopefully with all of you for our building science symposiums. So shout out to um, all of the people that put those things together. Yeah, so for sure. Well, you know what? The the innovation housing uh, event that's coming up on the mall in Washington, D.C. There is 55 people showcasing the products this year. That's over double what it was last year. That's cool. Yeah. And, yeah. and Secretary of Housing is going to be there. The chair of the NEHB is going to be there greeting people, congressmen, senators, you know, you know. And guess what? I'm going to be there, too. So it's gonna be a Here's a blast from your past, Mark. I'm working on a project with Craig Savage. That's who I was house I'm working on down there. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Love it. All right. So, sure, we're going to. We're going to dive into a little bit more about what you do during, during the show as well. But, Mark, you got to tell us what you're up to these days. La Liberté, 
Not Mark Willie, not bare naked. That Mark right below me, right there. Mark, go ahead. Tell us what you're yeah, up thanks, to. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, Mark Willie's the only one who can qualify for that naked thing. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I've been. Uh, this is 38 years. I think I've been doing this, and so I started uh, pretty early on. You know, to coaching and teaching, building science stuff. Uh, considering ourselves experts at trying to sell products nobody wanted. And, you know, the way in which that we see the market evolving has really, thankfully, to shows like yours and and the events like Cheryl's, uh, where she's trying to put more people in front of uh, the, the builders who really want to make change. How do we get this uh, idea about building better buildings that are healthier, safe, durable, efficient, affordable to operate and maintain, resilient to whatever is going on in the climate, and, and really make these products uh, better, and, uh, and really help our trades understand how to build them. And those are kind of our disconnects, Dave. So lately I've been trying to work on, through construction instruction, we've been creating classes in Denver to say, here's a two day class, not only in the theory of what goes on, but we go back into the lab and we build stuff and we demonstrate convection and thermodynamics and psychrometrics. And we look at a house that's under construction, uh, it's been built in there, it's about 500 square feet, multiple du ducting systems and builders bringing their trades to say, hey, maybe we should learn how to do that. There's an example of some of the stuff we do. And so what's been really powerful is to see that the manufacturers realize that putting a product on the street is not enough. You have to teach somebody who's going to how to use it. You've got to share the technology. You've got to test it in front of somebody. So they go, you know, I, I think that actually worked. I haven't been doing it that way. Maybe I'll change my, my process. And as we know, you know, builders don't build houses, the trade base does. So we really have to get focused on helping all of our trades execute on change because nobody likes change sometimes. Change always feels painful, but change can really be the, uh, the, the only thing that really ever happens, right? It's inevitable that change occurs. Let's just help move those things forward. So all of you on, on this talk are all doing that, all trying to raise the dialogue, change what's happening, and do a better job of building better houses for, for the future. Well, and that's what it's all about. Like, how do we build better homes for the future? How do we build healthier homes, more sustainable homes? And how do we do it in a way that everybody can participate? regardless of who you are that's the big thing how do we get everybody to participate in how we build homes for the for the future not just the mark willies of the world and the jake brutons of the world or whoever right how do we get everybody involved mark and i think that is the big big question we're all striving to to get answers to and i think you could help us maybe well i think i think you've, you've, all, you've all seen it you know you've all experimented with the idea that thanks to the change in social media i mean i'd say the previous 20 years was a one every day you know i had a I traveled, uh, you know, 120, 130 flights a, a year. And he would go to a place somewhere like Bozeman, Montana, talk to 50 year builders. And he'd sit down there for a while and they'd walk away and he'd say, they picked up one or two things and then they left. There's really right. no place for them to check back. Who would they consult with? Where would they look it up? You know, there really wasn't enough um, consistency. And now we have all these forms of social media that are having other builders go, hey, I did this, didn't work so good. But uh, here's what I tried. And someone goes, you should try this. I just did that. The humility of our industry is, is really showing through to say, we can all help each other if that's truly what the mission is. And, uh, and I see more of that happening. So there's more of an exponential change in where transition is occurring than it was at this kind of plodding along. You know, we got hammered by McKinsey saying that we're the slowest industry in, product, in uh, productivity improvements for decades. And, right. uh, and and now I think we're going to watch that. It's not just, hey, I got a new nail gun, which was the biggest advancement from the hammer, but I've really got an understanding about flashing and integration and different sheathing types and taping and air sealing and ventilation and blower door testing. You know, all of that has to be the way we make buildings work. We just can't go back to build them like we used to because they just didn't work all that good. Yeah, Beautiful. for sure. That's the end uh, of the show, folks. There you go. There it is. <laughs> there, there's a saying that I refer to, and uh, I butcher it because I butcher everything that, uh, in my own words, but it's uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. And our marketplace has had so many new materials, and that sequencing uh, of, of those materials has been showcased on both the platform uh, that Dave mentioned that Cheryl has at uh, IBS, as well as what you guys do 
in Colorado. So uh, let's mm -hmm. dive into some of these Q and A's, huh? Well, yeah. for sure. And I think, uh, and Cheryl, this is going to be really interesting to hear your take on it, being on the front lines, working with the people that are using the products in the field on a regular basis, working with the manufacturers who want the people in the field to be using their products on a regular basis. Uh, and then you're also working with trade shows across the country, if not around the world, to figure out how this all comes together and makes sense for those of us that need to learn about all these new products, all those of us that need to attend and understand how do we learn about it and how do we educate? So I'm looking forward to hearing you chime in on this, especially after this first question. So, and I'm going to start off with uh, Mark, not bare naked, Mark, the other Mark, you know, today's market, uh, you know, is slowing just enough to catch our breath. What things could contractors focus on in preparation for the next stage of growth? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And I, I, I've, I've just noticed that I think everybody realized that things have slowed down. Interest rates have climbed up a little bit. Material prices have stabilized a little bit better, at least the lumber has. And, yeah. and I think now it's giving us a chance to say, all right, so now what do I need to focus on? I see some builders really focusing on, like I said, bringing in the software to really operate their business, creating Gantt charts and better scheduling process. Because we know communication is the nemesis of our industry, right? If yeah. Just because somebody's not connecting longer lead times and longer processing times. So if we look at the efficiency of our building, whether some things are offsite, very easy to do. Some things right. are either pre-cut, pre-manufactured, or we do full offsite. All of those are strategies to improve the efficiency of the way we run our business because as prices stabilize, we want to find a way to get some margin out of that. And margin isn't cutting the quality. Um, it's cutting the process time that we use it because labor is such an enormous part of what we spend. So I think part of it is to sit back and say, all right, I'm, I'm gonna build a better house, I'm gonna insulate it better, make it tighter, provide my clients with a healthier, safer, more durable building, but I gotta figure out a way to do that so it's very efficient. Who am I gonna reach out to to train my trades? Do I use the, the guys in the field and the manufacturers? Like, like when Cheryl finds companies and things, they're, they're like, well, we don't know how to get to market. She's like, well, you better get out there and put those people in place Right. And make that happen. So that's why at IBS, you know, for years she fought, she fought at HP, you know, to kind of let it come on, let me come in. We'll put you in the back corner where nobody can find you, maybe outside when it's raining, and then nobody will really hear from you. And NHB's really changed their their tune and said, you know what? We better be at the forefront of getting builders to communicate what they need to do and then turn around and tell their trades, hey, could you do this? So bring your trades along and bring them to an event, bring them to a show, send them to CI Live. I, I had one builder that he came and his heating contractor came with him. And the first opening day, the heating guy sat like this, like, I, I don't got anything to learn. I've been doing this for 20 years. And, and all of a sudden his shoulders kind of dropped after about the second day. And he's like, going, oh, yeah, I could probably do a better job of that. And all it was was duck sizing and straightening pipe and getting the grills to be correct and right sizing wasn't making it smaller and, and not meeting the load. It was saying, what are all the inputs that I need to learn? That, so I go, I think we can do this with four tons. This is the size of ducks we're going to use. And we're going to use an upgraded air handler. that has got a variation in speed because I guess we don't really need that highest speed at the moment. So um, those really help. The builder goes back and says, so that means I don't need as big a duct work. It's not way up in the attic. Maybe I can get it in conditioned space. Everybody together has to work to make that little process work. To change something as simple as, as HVAC takes a lot of people, framers, HVAC guys, the purpose person doing the load, and everybody executing on insulation. If I was a mechanical contractor and I went, God, that insulation looks really sloppy, I think I'm going to increase size a little bit because I just don't trust the enclosure. So you like, so if I looked around and go, wow, this is really well done. They're air sealing beautifully. Those are really high performance windows. I bet you I could do a better job of right sizing my equipment that would help my customer and help the uh, the end customer, the, the consumer. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like, well, there's a whole training question on that and how we get to that. But Cheryl, you know, I really want to hear your take on what Mark was talking about, uh, not not just from the technical aspect, but, you know, about the products that are out there, because 
one issue like Mark was get, hitting on was really talking about, OK, this is what we can do to be more efficient. And the builder and the contractor, the mechanical contract, they're all working in conjunction together and saying, yeah, but man, I insulated this house. It is so airtight. If you don't put ventilation in, you're going to suffocate at night. Right. Like that. But that conversation doesn't happen on a, on a full scale you know, across the country, every building zone in, in, in America. Um, but they're trying to do that, right, Cheryl? They are. Um, I remember when we first started um, getting on a stage, it was kind of like Mark would be the person that would tell, why do we even care about this stuff? You know, how does this all work and why do we care? And I always wanted to connect. The, it's great that everybody now understands why, but let's show them how and by the way, how not to. So <laughs> that's kind of one of the fun parts of my job. I like the how not to actually better than the how. Well, and and so that's it, right? And and again, you know, Mark, uh, you know, Bare Naked Mark and I talk about this all the time that, you know, we're very siloed. We all run in our own little thing. And I tease Mark all the time because we like to put PH instead of an F when we talk about it, right? But the only people that know what that means are the people within our own little group. Everybody else goes, well, these 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 people can't spell. Right. Why, why are they putting a pH in front of, you know, framing or what have you? And I and I think, you know, that's one of the things like you're talking about, Cheryl. We look at all the people like Mark and others, you know, buying home building this old house, all of these people that you work with. Um, they're out there trying to spread the word, but they still only have a small audience compared to what we need to reach. Yeah, absolutely. I find every time I'm at a symposium at lunchtime, I like to have lunch with the new kids on the block, if you want to call it that. But I try to find the brand new builders that just took yeah. a chance to come to one of the symposiums and sit and ask them, well, you know, what are you up against and what are we teaching here that really sunk in? I mean, if they walk away with one thing, I'm I think we're successful, but I just keep we just keep trying. Totally. Yeah. Uh we always have to keep trying. There's always that new face at the table. And I tell you, uh, we've all know what it's felt to be the new person in the room. And when you're welcomed by the other folks, that's going to cause a chain reaction of you taking that same step of welcoming others. And when we're welcoming others, it brings a perfect segue, Cheryl, to that question is um, how can we provide more trainings for the market and these professionals and welcome them to the next level. Uh, Mark or Cheryl, one of you take it first. Go for it, Mark. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's a great question, Mark. And I, I would believe that we know that there's, there's multiple people involved here. You know, when you look at what Glenn's been doing on code training, he's just been done doing such a marvelous job. If you haven't seen Glenn, Glenn, uh, Glenn Matheson, he's, he's really done a beautiful job of demystifying code. And I think when he starts coming online to say, listen, guys, this isn't uh, what you think it is. Here's what it really means. And here's why it's important. We all start realizing that there's not enemies of the state trying to make our job difficult. Code changes feel a little onerous sometimes. You're like every three years we see a new code change. But I think part of it is that we watch the evolution of code going from, you know, let's make sure it, you don't get electrocuted and the staircase doesn't fall on your head to let's talk about, you know, ventilation and and proper air, air sealing and proper water management techniques and making sure that these things are done well. The building inspector is not your, your QA, QC contractor. It's somebody who's really trying to be a partner in your growth. So you have to say, I'm going to really think about code as something that's just the bottom of where I have to get to. And I'm going to try to build above that. So how well do I need to know the local code? I was mentioning today before we got started, I was up in, in, a, in a city in, in northern Washington state. And the builder told me that they just they just nailed uh, and, and selected 100 building permits so that they didn't have to build to the new code until next year because it was coming into place. And I was like, I couldn't really get why that felt so, so wonderful. So I'm going to sell my homeowner a house that says, um, hey, by the way, I just wanted you to know that your new house, when we get it finished, it won't meet the current building code, but I kind of did you a favor. To um, the idea about how do we um, get everybody, all the trades involved. And in California, for example, with the code changing to net zero, look at all the trades that really were never, um, and still to this day, haven't been coached and trained how to do it. I call those non-funded mandates, right? Yeah. So we watch uh, Washington State will now require exterior insulation. And when that goes into effect now, it's going to be pushed to November. All the builders are like, so like, what do I do? 
do I just nail the foam on the wall and it's okay to stick the siding on the wall? So all of us have to realize that the evolution of better buildings is going to be uh, water managed and flashed properly, proper selection of windows, proper wall insulation to be not only the type of cavity, but the type of potentially exterior. The flashing details, as Mark just mentioned, is really critical because buildings that are more thermally efficient dry slower. Um, how do we get the mechanical systems to have the heating, cooling, dehumidification, or humidification based on occupant expectations? And then the idea about air quality really should be something paramount. We learned during COVID, if you're not taking care of the re air you're respirating, that's probably your greater risk. And installing ventilation is easy. Just don't forget to do it. So I, I think there's a nice way of bringing, I probably mentioned what uh, 10 trades in that discussion. And so if you looked at all of them and you lined them up and you go, do they all know their role? And you're like, maybe not. So, so there's that part of bringing your team along and having maybe you have bi-weekly or bi-monthly uh, training sessions and say, guys, here's the new thing. Come on out to site. Let's all learn. I've been on job sites where the framer doesn't know the window installer. I'm like, how do you not know each other? And uh, well, we've been working together, but I finish framing and I never see him again. And the window guy has to make all these corrections that if the framer knew that he could do something just a little better, it would help those guys. That's teamwork. And I think that's where we save costs and reduce problems. Yeah. So, man, Mark, you hit so much on there that I can go to town on. I'm just trying to pick which one to go to town on. Here, here's the thing, right? Even with the trades and who comes first, chicken or the egg, right? Every job that I have built, you know, in every home, whether it's multifamily, single family or commercial, a pre-construction meeting and not just one, several brings up so many problems that we never knew existed because yeah. each trade knows what code changed. Each trade knows, you know, how they have to do something based on something else that we're not looking at. And it causes a significant change. So that's one side. Like, so if you're not having pre-construction meetings on your job site, that's your first biggest mistake, in my opinion. The second, the second thing, and I'm on a soapbox, Mark, so hang on, Willie, there. Um, the second thing on this is, you know, I, I, I'm trying to say this in a way like, so our government, for instance, we don't like them when they tell, they don't, we don't like when they tell us to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the trades are kind of the same way, like when a new code comes out. That, that's like saying, no, all, all the, what do you mean I got to build it airtight? We've been opening the windows for a year. You want fresh air, open the effing window, right? That's kind of what they do. What incentive do they have to learn something new would be the first thing. And then outside of what incentive, the biggest way to get people to want to do this is if they have buy-in and they understand the value and the benefit and they start feeling like, hey, I really am a master plumber. I really am a master framer, right? Like, how do, how do we get them to be like, all right, well, you want to be on this pedestal. You want to be a master framer. You want to be a master plumber. Well, be a master. But how do we get them to buy into wearing that superhero cape and doing their job and taking it to the next level? That's where it's hard because everybody's so busy. Nobody wants to stop. They got to put food on their table. That's, you know, a lot of all right. that's, that's a big deal, though. And I also, if you look at builders who have been pretty successful, ask them about their trades. And sometimes I'll tell them that guy's been with me for 20 years. Yeah. And you're like, why has he been with you for 20 years? He goes, because he works with me um, to make, make these changes occur. And, and I need teamwork. You got to find a way. If you want to be the best trade contractor in the industry, learn to be the best first. So even if you're a little more expensive, the guy's going to try somebody else. He goes, man, I got plumber just crushed, messed up everything. I got to get somebody else. You're like, actually, if um, I know you saw my price was a little higher, but here's what I do. I work with all the other trades to make sure that I line out on the walls where I'm going to be. If there's a conflict with an electrician or, or somebody else, I make sure that they know that I can make a change. I, I call it subcontractor combat. And I've asked Builder, have you ever seen one trade tear another trade's workout? He's like, yeah, I see it all the time. I'm like, that should never happen. Because if we're communicating effectively, shouldn't the trades get together on site and go, who gets this wall? Me, me, that's my wall. <laughs> well, well, you happen to line up with the only wall that bypasses the, the, the big beam that goes in there and we all have to get across. How could we do that? And I think that that's what you're saying about pre-cons are get everybody together and say, where do you see the gaps either in the plan in an office or on the job site? But on the site, Dave, as you mentioned, sometimes it's too late. How do we look at the plan and say, does anybody see something wrong here? And you're like, I don't know if you guys noticed, but where that bedroom is, if you turn that closet 
it would give us a place to go through and everybody goes, oh, yeah, we can turn the closet. When yeah. should we do that? After it's framed or right now on the plan? So I, I think there's a goal to be the very best at what you do, whether it's, whether it's being a father, you know, being a husband, being a good con trade contractor, be amazing at what you choose to do. You will always be successful. You don't have to be the cheapest. You can just be the very best. And those guys always find work and they'll always find somebody who says, you're not using Tom's plumbing. <laughs> He's yeah. the best. You got to use them. So being amazing is learning, practicing, getting the newest tools, make sure your business is extraordinary. And, and creating the pathway to, to, to say yes and, Mark, creating the path. He froze. Well, we'll come back to him in just a second here. So be amazing, right? I understand trades wanting to learn. And oh, sure, I'm going to go back. Freeze? Sorry. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. You want to finish nope. that? Uh-oh. Uh oh, frozen again. Frozen again. So with so let, let me let me go to you on this, Cheryl. So when we start thinking about um, the trades, and you know, I hate to use the word, because I, I I think of I think of what we do as journalism, at least on the Dave Cooper Live side, right? And but then we also talk about all the influencers that you work with, and they're not just influencers; they're also practitioners out in the field. And, and, you know, you look at Travis and, and Joe and all these guys, right? And, and they're putting on symposiums, and we'll talk about that one coming up in Connecticut as well. But what, what drives them? I, I think, like, we got to take these people and say, what drives them to not only build better, but want to put themselves out there publicly every day to get ripped apart when somebody says, well, that's not right, or I've been doing it this way 100 years, you know, for 100 years. You guys are just wasting your time and energy. My homes are still standing, dot, 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 right? Yeah. What are you seeing that is a common denominator, Cheryl? Because maybe that's the answer to how we get all the trades to buy into what these people do. Well, I've been lucky throughout the years. I mean, the first person I had on my zone, we only had 23 people, by the way, that came that year to IBS to watch how to build better. That oh. 23, we were scared. Gord Cook was on that stage and he carried that conversation, whether there was one person or 23 um, we had 9,000 before COVID. So um, I think the tides are turning a little bit. Meeting Travis and Joe a couple of years ago um, kind of changed my life. They had a different philosophy than I kind of grew up with. They were like, we don't care that the that the ne my next door neighbor is also a builder. We're going to share cool. our ideas. And I don't know if it was COVID that changed that, but Mark, I mean, you remember back then, nobody was sharing anything with anybody. It was, this is my box this is my neighborhood and i'm going to build i'm not going to tell you how i solve this problem because i don't want you to compete with me and i think the new i'm not going to say the new builders but i think there's a huge change in sharing information and yeah. i don't know i hope covid i don't know i don't know what changed it but that's what i I'm think seeing. social media has changed it and made it easier yeah. i mean raise your hand if you use youtube to learn how to do something i do it all the time <laughs> every day right I think that's the rest of the world, too. Yeah, I think it's a great point. You know, and I, I usually use this as a, kind of an interesting analogy. I'd say that, you know, when doctors make a mistake, they they do something and they publish it in the New England Journal of Medicine. And go, hey, I did this to a guy and I, he didn't make it kind of screwed up. But, hey, I, you know, I just learned from it. The other doctor goes, oh, crap, I almost did that to a guy. So glad right. I read this, you know, that in our industry, if you if a builder has a problem, you can't imagine sitting at the HBA meeting one night. Some guy goes, hey, you know what happened the other night? I had a skylight fell right out of the roof. It smashed into the home. It almost killed the homeowner. Right. No way is that going to come out, right? You're going to fix it at night in full camo so that nobody knows. So what we do is we don't share successes and failures. And, and it's a lot of pride, too. But we also realize that a failure is the only way someone else learns. And how many builders in this country have made the same exact mistake because they just didn't know, not because they don't care, not because they're not trying, because right. they just didn't know. And and the more, like Cheryl said, the more we get this uh, this audience to share, which is Travis and those guys going, you know what, I don't care. I, I worked with a builder in, in Oklahoma. His name is Vernon McCowan. He's got a company there called um, Ideal Homes. And Vernon was always building better high-performance houses. And his salespeople said, Vernon, why are you sharing everything we do with everybody? They're going to catch up. And he goes, no one will catch up with me. <laughs> He goes, I'm going to be three years ahead when they get to where I am today. 
If I don't raise the bar of everybody around me, then I can't advance my product so that I'll always be higher priced and they're building inferior and they're going to go, yeah, we don't do what those guys do. So he said, I always raise all the boats and together I'm just going to have a better boat, um, but I'm going to raise all boats. And I think that that's what's changed. And what Cheryl said about Travis and is that he said, um, I really want to share my successes, my failures and, and what's going on. Kyle's another good example of that, that um, how do we do that as, as, a, as a team, but as a committed industry to healthier, safe, more durable, more resilient uh, buildings. And I think that when we all have that same goal, we're going to see uh, if that's what your meetings are like, Cheryl. In those rooms that you've gotten together now, you've got, what, five of them? You're seeing 100 builders, standing room only. They, they're keeping them away, saying, I'm here to learn. Tell me what you got. They sit at a table and share. And we're also seeing a lot of youth come into our industry, whether it's yeah. fathers bringing in their sons or just young men and young women saying, I love this industry. It's a trillion dollar business. I'd like to learn how to do this. And, and what, a, what a great evolution of our industry. The attitude of learning, the attitude of leadership, and um, it all comes with, with trainings, right? And starting something new. So that's stressful to try something new. So what is your approach, Mark, in, in eliminating that stress and creating that, um, that, that, that chocolate bar or that Oreo cookie dunking into the milk so that they're welcoming the new step forward? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's one of the things that we learned at CI Live when we were doing our trainings there is that we would go in the classroom and talk about the things that happen in classrooms. As you talk about the physics and here's what happens, and here's all the stuff. But then after about an hour and a half, we go, that's enough of that. Let's go in the back. And so the lab is about uh, 9,000 square feet. We probably have 25 mock-up walls and all the walls spin around and people are looking. So you see builders like we are, we're very tactile in, in how we, we learn picking apart the flashing, looking underneath it and go, oh, that's how we do it. Then we have a blank a blank wall, a bunch of flashing and materials in a window and go, hey, you guys, let's put one in the way you do it. So then they put the window in and they're all trying to make suggestions. And then we right there and then at the end of the day, we water test it and say, hey, let's see if that worked. We water test it. And then when we get done the next morning, we tear it apart and we go, let's see if any water got through. And they're like, I didn't know that I do that every day. I, I, I'm not going to do that tomorrow. So, so because we are such a hands-on industry, if we share successes and failures right then and there and demonstrate it's what, it's what made the uh, construction zones um, and, and the building zone in NHB finally change the whole game. We built, there's, Cheryl's had them build full stages. They're up there hanging drywall. Here's a trick for putting right. in flashing. Here's one of the details I've used when I put on insulation. You know, if you use this fastener, it's way better than this one because this one always goes through, but this has got that big face on it and it doesn't penetrate. And everybody's like, okay, I'm using that. I'm using that. And so I, I think we have to blend the ability for us to physically do it. And then have it, even if you're on a bit job site, have the rep come say, you know what, if I buy your product, I want you to show up with somebody knowledgeable and show me how to put it on. Maybe it's the lumber guy, maybe it's the company representative, but don't just guess show up and have a team of people that say, let's build a strategy around doing this right. Yeah. Cheryl, with all these big stages that you have uh, amassed across all these trade shows, you mentioned that you've seen a lot of growth in the amount of trades that are showing up. Yeah. So mainly on framing, air tightness, and, and, and the likes. Do you see a future at these shows of having plumbers and electricians also there learning what their roles are, you know, so they can be focused and they can bring value back from a trade show to their customers or general contractor or whoever they work with? I do. I think that I'm kind of a cheater because I have Joe and Travis. Travis is an electrician and Joe's a plumber. Um, as well as builders, right? So yeah. when we're talking through our stages, let's take the craft technique zone, for example, we actually put a mini split in. We actually installed it in a space where you would be installing it. And with Ross Trithuli and those guys, we talked about the electricity. We talked about the plumbing. We talked about the space, how it works, the air quality. So that was cool. Um, so people talk about Florida, you know, Florida never wants to learn. That's not true. We are doing live events at the SEBC show in July. We've been there for 
well, about six years now providing them. And it's a totally different education experience. They just want, they want their roofs to stay on is one yeah. of the big things because there's hurricanes all the time. So we're talking more about, um, you know, driven rain and wind and that kind of stuff where we only touch on it sometimes in the other areas that I don't know. So we see people that attend that as well. So I think there's a thirst for knowledge. I don't think there's enough training anywhere. I just, we keep selling out our space and Mark, I know you guys do and yeah, it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. So let me ask, let me ask this kind of, and I'm gonna put this back to Mark and Mark, you know, bare naked, you can, you can chime in on this as well. You know, when, when we think about air tightness, we think about, you know, everybody's trying to achieve, not everybody, but in this group, that net zero or lower energy efficiency, sustainability, healthy living. Yeah. Um, there's no, there's not enough training out there, you know, air boss training. I'm an air boss. I went to SEGA's training. I had a blast and I, it was like an aha moment for me. And I went to their SEGA facility in, in Switzerland as well. But, you know, every time that happens and they say, well, we need air recovery ventilators now, right? HRVs, ERVs, whatever the case is, you know, I always come back to that, that, that same question, like one, where do they get trained to, to know how to size it and do it? Where do they get training to even understand when they need it or don't need it? Um, like this is, this is really hard. And I know construction instruction has it, but let me just throw this out there. Greg Ugaldi's in the audience. I know he's listening the past chair of the national association of home builders. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had construction instruction programming, on all of NAHB's, you know, marketing broadcasts that we could train everybody. So, but with that said, Mark, how do you, how do we get the buy-in for it? How do you get the training for it? Like, I know we're talking about, like you have construction instruction and, and, and there's stuff out there, but most of the trades are like, eh, I'm busy. It's been working. I, I you know, I got to charge my GC more or whatever now, and they're not going to want to pay for it. So, how do, how do we do that? It's a good thing, David. You know, you're right on the money there is that I would say ven mechanical ventilation. I started uh, doing the first part of mechanical ventilation in 1984 in Minnesota. And I would say over, it took a period of years, but Minnesota has the highest concentration of mechanical ventilation in every house in the country, hands down. And, and what it really took was a lot of, uh, a lot of education and training, but I, I'll put it this way. You know, you mentioned something I always, I always enjoy. When do I know that I need ventilation? Well, let me ask on this. Oh, I'll do a little quick uh, mini quiz of the, of the three of you. How many of you are, which one of you, I should say, are continuous breathers? Just get a show of hands if I could see that. So, so uh, in, in, in that, how often would you like fresh air? You kind of want it whenever the house leaks enough, or do you think a continuous ventilation because I'm a continuous breather means that it's essential that every house gets it no different than a furnace and ducting and a ventilation system. So that has to be essential. It's not, I wonder if this house is gonna be tight enough. It's, I wonder if this house is gonna have human beings in it, therefore they will need ventilation. And, and that's the premise we have to get to. It can't be an addition to a quote, would you like an, a separate quote for ventilation? It's that if all the codes are requiring houses at three air changes or less, We've passed the game. Everybody needs fresh air. So if I was a homeowner, I'd say I want really good filtration to keep all the dust and pollens out of the air. And I'd like a steady supply of fresh air into all the bedrooms. Now I'm getting that, right? Well, no, not if you, unless you ask for it. Seems weird. I mean, and you guys, I don't know if any of you guys have any teenagers, but if you imagine open a teenager's bedroom after they've been sleeping for 12 hours and the door closed, you don't even want to go in that room, right? Yeah. So uh, ventilation is such a key thing that what we have to do is get companies like Brone and Panasonic and the companies making these equi this equipment getting more engaged with the training approach. And, you know, we, we have people like the Zip folks and the DuPont folks. They're out actively in the marketplace teaching them how to put on sheathing, right. tape it incredibly tight, flash every seam so the building is airtight. Yet who's behind them going, hey, by the way, <laughs> you just made that house hit 1.550 pascals. Well, to, well done. But did you put ventilation in? Uh, not this one, but, but we're thinking about the next one. So I think all of us in, in all the discussions have to make indoor air quality. What I've been doing lately when I talk about HVAC, I just put H slash AC. That's what we're doing. We do heating and air conditioning. 
the V part shouldn't be part of the equation unless it's actually installed in that discussion. Are you doing HAC or HVAC? And if you're just HAC, you're kind of being a hack. You know? Well, H Mark, when you, uh, when you go to your kitchen, Mark, do you expect your refrigerator to keep everything cold inside or only when you want cold milk? Just when I want cold milk. Otherwise, I want that stuff <laughs> rotten and moldy and, you know, <laughs> absolutely yeah. right. On the same accord, when you go to take a shower, uh, you want warm water to come out. So we expect our hot water tanks uh, to be ready. We expect our refrigerators to be ready. But yet, we only shower for maybe 8 to 20 minutes a day. We only open our refrigerator two to three times a day. So if those are constants but not thought about, then our constant should be exactly what you should. What you said is we need to breathe all the time. So ventilation is a priority and penetration is a priority. We have a window schedule, but we don't have a penetration schedule. And those leaks are what we find out about when it's often a little too late. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that you see a host of companies who are really specializing in fluid applied, mechanically applied, integrated sheathings. Those are all products that are really trying to get us very focused around reducing water intrusion into our buildings. But every time we do that, we start getting a tighter and tighter enclosure, of course. Now we're seeing that the, the code's asking for all ducts inside conditioned space. So now cathedralizing the insulations become the new thing. I'm going to spray from the roof. You're like, oh, okay, so there's no attic ventilation. All, all of them are good things, but all of those things happen without somebody saying you must install a ventilation system, not just a duct in the furnace that runs once in a while. It's got to be something with intent. And I, I think that that really matters. And I don't think it's, it's a hard change and it's not necessarily an expensive one. But um, for example, like when I mentioned about Beezer Homes going to net zero, the very first thing they said, what should we do first? We said in every single house, begin the process of installing a energy recovery ventilation in every house. Once you perfect that, now let's go to figure out the rest of the tools of thermal insulation, air sealing, upgrading windows. But because every time you're gonna eventually get to a house that's just tight enough or significantly tighter, it's okay, the ventilation is in place. So if I was a builder, I'd make sure that every house gets an energy recovery system. Then I can work on whatever system I choose, exterior insulation, T-stud, uh, zip sheathing, whatever I choose to do, I'm gonna make sure that that building is designed and improved all the time, but my homeowners are always gonna get fresh air. And, and I think that's really a strong commitment that I wish we could do a better job of integrating starting tomorrow it would be nice. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with that. Do you think with the energy codes changing, with the new technology, the software, you know, for example, that's out there, digital twins using renderings now, you know, uh, or virtual renderings, I should say, BIM, BIM models, um, and, and the desire to do better for the planet that, that the younger generation has more so than our generation had in the past? Is that going to bring the youth back into our industry? Because we're kind of starting to play in all the worlds they're, they've been playing in for a while now. Yeah, I love that. Je I mean, uh, Cheryl said that uh, she's got this, she, she called them her new kids. And there's this new group of uh, young young kids. Framers, right? I, yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. those guys. Oh, they're, they're, doing, they're doing cool stuff. They, they are they're doing cool stuff. And that's what I like is that there's, there's no borders on or, or binders or obstructions to what they're going to do. They're just like, well, why wouldn't I just do that? You're like, because, um, yeah, go. <laughs> you know, and it's a husband and wife team too. So the young lady frames right along with everybody else as she should. I mean, I built my first home with my dad and my husband, and we didn't have any power nailers. I don't want to age myself though, but I'm just saying. <laughs> you're just, you're just, a, you're just a, a, a truest. I, I think they too that if you look at um, women in construction, we're seeing more of that, and I think that that brings a, a lot more heart into the idea that we've got to look at families within our buildings, you know? And Women in construction, I'm celebrating, man. Yeah, man, I, and I, I think that we're like, CI has got a course coming up in August called Women in Construction, and we've got all women instructors 
Um, and we always got to be careful with that nowadays because everybody, all the men are going to go, why can't I go? You know, but but I think that it's really important. So we've got a course coming up just with with uh, you know Emily and, and Shauna doing the doing the training. But I, but I do think that it's it's a it's a collection of youth understanding that if they really they really want us to be aware of the planet for them, they said leave us a better future. We understand that carbon issues and all that stuff might be out there. That climate change is there, but some of you guys are are kind of done. We we don't want to be done. And so, could you help us build yeah. a better a better life, a better a better place for our families? They might not be as big a houses, but even in, should my tiny house be healthier and safer and more durable? So, whatever we build, let's think about the occupant inside, the longevity of its life. It should last a hundred years, you know, or or more. How do we put all that together? And I think that our youth has sees no obstacles where we're always coming up with a reason why you can't. They don't see as many can'ts. Uh, the I can'ts got buried in the shoebox and dug in the backyard. There's no more I can'ts. There's only I can. And that's what propels us forward. And I love seeing these uh, young kids are going like, yeah, I'm doing that. And like, way to go. I love it. Well, it is, it is great to see the younger generation. And Cheryl, I was looking at those framers earlier and I, they wear GoPros on their ha hats and I'm up there and I'm looking, I'm getting seasick the way they turn and they're just showing you everything that you're doing. And I'm like, oh my God, I need a bigger screen or I'm going to start throwing up. I mean, they're just, they're just going at it. Oh, that's <laughs> Which, so they were on our stage at IBS. We had a framing contest. Well, why yeah. wouldn't we have a framing contest, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think they were actually the superstars of the show. So, you know, shout, shout out to Kaufman Construction in uh, Colorado. They were, they have been going to classes ever since IBS yeah. to learn more. So they're adamant about building better. They may be framers, but I see them really evolving. You know, they're our future. Yeah, they, they definitely are. And I think people are going to relate to them. The younger generation is definitely going to relate to them. So I, I think it's cool. And I think they're, they're, they're somebody we sure going to have to have on this show and, and talk to them. Maybe they can, maybe they can come to us live from their hard hat or from their GoPros somewhere oh, cool, out there. Yeah. As long as you stabilize it. Yeah. You got to stabilize their cameras, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, we're, we're getting close on time, everybody, but I do I do have uh, a couple things here that, that I want to go over. You know, um, Mark, you spend a lot of time consulting. You spend a lot of time helping builders become better. You travel all over the country doing it. Um, and when we talk about energy code, when we talk about the better products, when we talk about being just better in general as a builder and working with our trades, all of these things are great. But the one person that's writing the check, the customer has to buy into it as well. It's true. And, and so when you have the builder sit there, you know, like you said, how do we get the customer to buy in? What are the tips and tricks that you use to tell the uneducated? Cause they don't know what Pascal's mean. Right. Or they like, it, like that works here. And even me, I'm like a little fuzzy all the time on it. <laughs> but how do, how do we get their buy-in in common languages? What are some tips and tricks you could leave our audience with that would help them sell this so they can implement it in their business? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question, Dave. And I, I think that there are some easier ways to do it than we think. Part of it is that the people that sell the home, sometimes in a realtor mix, know very little about, about innovation. Yeah. And so they're not really saying anything about it. But let's put it this way. Every house that you build and every price that you give should include all of that. And it should just be across the board, not upgrade. You shouldn't say, um, oh, by the way, now that you've got a price, I was thinking, would you like some ventilation? And, and the homeowner goes, well, do I need it? He goes, well, it's not in the code, gone. What if they said, say, we've got the price point and the homeowner goes, geez, I'd like to do a little value engineering. Well, what we could do, I could pull out the fresh air for your kids so then I can just, um, we could probably just like hope that you guys open windows. Would you like me to take out the fresh air for your family? And they're going to go, no. Um, what I could do is I could cut back the flashing. So what we're going to do is we're going to go with some cheaper tape and we're not really going to caulk anything, but we could do that. And if there's leaks and spiders and stuff coming in, you know, you'll just use some sprays and stuff. That'll kind of help. It was that what you'd like us to take out. And they're going to go, N -n -n no, I don't want to do that. We could make the insulation cheaper and I can get these really simple bats that just kind of smash in the wall. We'll take out all those that foam stuff and we'll make the house. It's probably going to cost you a third to half as much more to heat and cool it over the years. But I can cut some stuff like that out. We, we just don't do a good job of reversing out that.
what kind of product would you like to build? Right. This one, then sell that one, talk about that one, communicate that to the buyer and quit adding the things we know that have to be in there as features instead of making that the baseline. You could always cut back and say, you know, one of the things we could do is there's two types of flooring. I can go with an engineered floor. I can go with a regular hardwood floor. More and more, I'm using some engineered floors. That could save us a little bit of money and actually allow you one to two sandings. Would you like to do that? Well, how much would that save us? A couple thousand dollars, and that might be a better choice. There is the kind of variations that should be chosen. Not do I want fresh air flashing and good insulation? So I think those are easier steps to make. And they go to the store and they look at it. They talk to the person selling the flooring. What do they always come back buying? The better flooring. They're yeah. like, they're going to go, I'm up, I upgraded the cabinets. Builders would tell me, I get a home buyer in and they're like, right here. They're right at the edge. Can't buy another thing. They go to the design center and blow 30 grand extra. And they're like, well, my mom gave me some extra money. So we, uh, we crushed it. So Build your base product as one that's healthy, safe, durable, efficient, reliable, sustainable, and resilient. Make that your base product. Then offer improved triple glazed windows if you want to, but do the right thing the first time. Then you're not trying to pitch them on what you know is right. Make it the baseline. Wow. That's awesome stuff. So, Last question, then we're going to go to a couple comments. I know I said maybe the last one was the last one, but I always have a last or the last. <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at some of our notes, right? When we add better product like flooring, when we add better product like a better vapor barrier that breathes one way and not both way, or whatever the case is, or an air barrier, sometimes the cost could be a little bit more, Mark, yeah. for a builder, right? And we all know as a consumer, we're all shopping for the best price. We're all, you know, and as a builder or a general contractor, your only job on that first meeting with a client is to not get eliminated. So right. they come back the second time, right? We're trying not to get eliminated. If you could give us just two things that will help them sell a better product at a higher price versus their lower price competitors, what would those two things be? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really good comment. And I, and I, in the reality world, I get, so I get to drift off and say it's really easy to do it this way, but I would, I would find a way of looking at the comparisons between what we perceive as cost challenges to the marketplace. Do we really think that a couple layers of black paper stapled together is that much different in price than a layer of weather barrier that's really well installed? And you're like, well, it's 500 bucks difference. You're like, well, then that's insignificant. Yeah. Give the homeowner a piece of black paper, go just, just tear that. <laughs> um, it can only be exposed for no more than 10 to 12 days. Um, it's going to be up a lot longer than that. This product can make it for 60 days. It's what I prefer, but unfortunately, this is what's used in the marketplace. Um, I prefer not to use that. Uh, I think there's little steps that we can take that they've got to be more tactile too. So bringing a homeowner to a job site can be very powerful. Walk them around and say, by the way, we clean all of our job sites. Everything is cleaned up. If I'm a homeowner and I walk into a sloppy job site, that tells me a little bit about you. So walk a homeowner through say, you know, that's how we frame here. These details really stand out and here's why it matters. Your drywall will crack less. These are the things we put in place. Demonstrate to a customer just enough. They'll be overwhelmed and just enough of the things that make you look better. Talk to both homeowners. Look at the, uh, at the housewife. Look at, the, at the, the husband. Talk to both of them. Sometimes they all do is talk to the guy and they don't talk to her. And she walks around and she goes, he never even identified me and I'm part of the team. Make, make the experience with the client something where you listen better. Because David, isn't that one of the key skills? We talk yeah. too much and listen too little. So ask questions. Tell me about the last house you've lived in. Tell me about places you've lived that were really frustrating. Have you ever had any previous problems with the houses you lived in? Learn more about your client because there's maybe 10 things you could introduce them to, but there's only three you're gonna be able to tell them about that makes you amazing. They're gonna tell you what three they wanna hear about by telling you what they have. Our last house filled with spiders. We are killing them all the time. One of the reasons we do this is a method that helps reduce leakage, but it also reduces insects. I, I want that. <laughs> so pay attention, yeah. listen carefully, learn the technology, and then teach your trades. And if you follow that approach, price then becomes far less of, a, of an issue. And then you're differentiating from your competitors by just being better and being kinder and being a better listener. And those are remarkably important skills. Just like Cheryl. Yep. 
Just like Cheryl. Well, you know what it is? You're meeting a customer where they're at. Mark and I were talking about bare naked, Mark. You know, when we talk about the pH and all those fun things, we understand that, but the client doesn't. Sure. And by listening to what their past issues were, and you already know you have an answer to it and then addressing those three things, because out of the out of the 20 things you tell them in your meeting, they're only going to remember the three that are important to them. Correct. And if you can figure out what those three things are and they're different for everybody, I hate mm -hmm. to say it, but you got to be a bit of a psychologist. Right. I mean, you know, family planning, psychology and even wedding, you know, marriage counseling happens <laughs> during these events. That's okay. uh, I, I think they I think that's that's great. Mark, you've been shaking your head. I don't know if your sound's hurting a little bit, but I know and you're on mute, but I know you have uh, you have your own thoughts on this. There's nothing <clears throat> there's nothing to add. That is creating the menu, right, for success. That is filling yeah. the shopping cart with the items for success. Um, much of that was was ushered forward in a foreign word um, <clears throat> by, by the folks in lead, right? They came out with the design charrette. And that that again, as Dave says, that falls on a certain a certain group. But when that consumer uh, sees all of this in front of them and how that allows them to have less risk, to have better health and to have a better shelter. Right. The word shelter is really powerful in Mark's language um, that that is all there. And um, the stage is set for uh, for folks to come to, to Colorado in August and learn. And the stage is set for a couple places in Florida and Connecticut and whatnot that Cheryl has going on. I just love it, Dave. Yeah. Well, Cheryl, I, I mean, come on, let's, let's do a couple comments and then we're going to, we're going to let you hop in there and talk about the events that you have coming up uh, and some of the events that we're, we're both going to hopefully uh, be running into each other at. Uh, and then, you know, Mark, if there's any last words or things that we didn't touch on that you feel is very important to put out there, we'll put those out there, but I do know <laughs> we are getting uh, to the, to the end of the road here. So real quick through some comments, just because we love our supporters. Good doctors in the house. Dr. Brett Musson, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Musson. Love it. Greg Ugaldi, past chair of the National Association of Home Builder. He is the guy that updates the president a couple of times a year. Do you still get to do that, by the way? If you do, I want to go with you. I'll be your camera guy. Just <laughs> putting it out there, uh, just in case. Andrew Seely, somewhere in Texas. What's up, my friend? Three years of BS, making introductions between people. Ways of building better, bright future. Absolutely. Oh, we were talking about flashing. Ha, ha, ha. Well, there we go. Let's flash it right with Bob Kelly from Chicago. This is one of the experts out there on how to flash correctly, right? He said, we passed once. A, I submitted a video of Christine Williamson and educated the code officials. So Christine's awesome. Yeah, love it. Thank you, uh, Bob. Good to see you. I hope all is well. Hey, we got Peter Molinar tuning in today, too. Technical mock-up displays a lot for easier comprehension of high-performance construction techniques. Demonstrates new technology. The good that. doctor had a comment we got to get to. Can't ever leave Dr. Musson out in the cold. The industry has to stop thinking of trades and think of skills. Trades are based on tactic. Task, tactic knowledge, tactic. Anybody know that one? Well, skills are explicit and taught. See, that's that doctor. He's putting words I can't say in there. Mark Parley in the house. Hey, Mark, great session. A lot to consider. Thank you for joining us today. Love it, love it, love it. Bob says great uh, programming today. Um, so, Cheryl, what do you got coming up? Well, the Connecticut event is June 20 and 21. We have a lumberyard sponsor this time, Rings End. So we're really yeah. excited to join with them. Um, we're also planning a little trip maybe the day before. Right. Ben, ben Bogey has a large project going on for the company. He works for 9,000 square feet, yes. swimming pool, indoors and everything. I think we have to go and take a look at it maybe by the you know bus. Uh, then we go to SEBC. I'm in Florida, so that will be coming up. And then we have September 12th and 13th. We will be in Holy Colorado. Moly. Yes, we will. Uh, let me see. I got to look at my chart. Charlotte, North Carolina, October 10th and 11th. We're yeah, we're considering going to uh, Southern California, maybe in December, but that's still under discussion. And let's not forget DC at the mall where I'll join. I'll get to see my buddies from NAHB that I work with all the time. And you, Dave. We'll be there. All right. I got that one that's ready to go. Yeah. Again, working with Craig Savage, who I worked for 
a million years ago, it seems, we created kind of the first learning management system that anybody ever heard of. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. That is That's awesome. It. You know what, Cheryl? I, I I don't think you get enough credit. You're behind the scenes uh -huh. on so many things. Honestly, like when you think about what you just rattled off, exactly. I think my life's stressful. That's a whole lot to be managing. So um, I, I just hope people realize how much you do for this industry. And if you're out there and you're a manufacturer or you're a trade show, Cheryl Lewis is the place to be. If you want the the heavy hitters in the industry, the influencers, the YouTubers, the, the journalists, by far, the only person to go to is you. So I'm just putting that out there. Thank you, Dave. I, I'm just truly blessed to be working with all of the great people that I've met and worked with throughout the years. Just it's been awesome. I have the best job ever. Yeah, you're awesome, sure. You do have an awesome job. Uh, have we forgot anything, Mark Willie? Yeah, as I unmute here, um, I think all those events are so important. And like always, if you can't make the events, remember to take the time to share them with your network. Our voice is used after we listen. So when we share that with our network, whether it's on your Instagrams, whether it's on yeah. your Facebooks, Twitter, Twitches, YouTubes, LinkedIn's, share that stuff. That's what we're doing today. And we're doing that so that you pick that up. That's a tool for you to use and use that tool to be the leader in your community. And I guarantee you, it will support the growth of your business and it will put projects on your calendar. Well done. Mark, the other Mark. Have, yeah. Did we forget anything? Is there anything you want to share before we wrap up? No, David, I think you're doing a great job. And I just think uh, everybody trying to excel at what they do really makes an, an impact. And, and I've, like I said, I've worked with Cheryl for guy over 20 years and Craig Savage. And there's some people that have really been quite remarkable. And I thank you for including uh, the uh, old timers too. Um, and so I, I look forward to, to working with people and helping them really realize if you go to CI Live, it is a heck of an experience. So look up on this site and see where classes are going on all the time and show up with your team. Really encourage you to see that uh, there's a lot happening. Change is uh, the, the only constant. So make it part of your life. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, for the rest of you out there, before I let you go, this Monday, that's right, this Monday, our expert interview is Marty Corrado. That's right. Marty Corrado is the director of industrialized construction for a company called Bolt. He has a long tenure field leader in large scale healthcare projects nationwide for over 35 years. He's been involved in multi trade prefabrication since 2007. He is the author of Prefabrication and the re-evolution of construction. He's passionate about changing our industry, just like everybody else that we've had on this show. So make sure you tune in Monday, 1 p.m. Eastern. Marty is a heavy hitter. He is a big player in this industry. And you know what? Like the rest of us, he's trying to make a difference. And that's Can I say one more thing, Dave? Aren't you joining us in Connecticut? I think we're doing Dave Cooper Dave. live there. I believe, I believe we are going to be doing Dave Cooper live there. I believe we're going to be doing a podcast. We might even, we might be doing some live streaming from the tours too, I guess, details to follow. Uh, and then that Friday, right after that, we're in Boston. I am a keynote speaker for, uh, for a, a Horizon event, and that's going to be a lot of fun, too, with Howick. So it's called Steel Horizons. It's an invite only, but there's going to be big players from around the world. So I don't know. I'm truly blessed to be able to have all these opportunities and meet all of you people uh, and have you on the show because it just creates this whole highway of networking that allows us to bring people together, and that's what's so awesome. There's so much I can't even keep track. <laughs> that's a good job. Well done, David. Thanks for including me. I appreciate you coming along. And Mark, it's great to see you again. And Cheryl as well. Stay, stay healthy and we'll talk soon. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, you guys just hang right there. We'll catch up right after the show if you want. If you got to go, go. The rest of you, here's the outro. We'll talk to you Monday. Bye, everybody.